Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, and we devote our weekly Black Table conversation to issues and topics of particular concern to people of African descent and others who are fighting to build a better society. We're joined today by a regular guest on the Black Star Network and here at the Black Table, a man who has taken the opportunities that are presented by this form of technology to be everywhere at once in many ways. COVID has been a tragedy and it has also freed him up to be in our ears and our minds and helping direct our thinking in ways that prior to COVID, uh, many fewer people were able to, to have access to in terms of his thought and his work. And that's none other than our friend and brother and comrade, Dr. Gerald Horn, the Morse Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston, author of several dozen books, including books he's written during COVID and ones that are up on the queue. We'll ask him about that near the end. And a man who, as I said, has been everywhere from the activist news network, seen him a lot, done a lot of work there, a guest on many platforms, including our daily show here on the Black Star Network with our brother Faraji Muhammad, and also the host of his own show, Freedom Now, on KPFK and the Pacifica Network, available everywhere you have digital access. And that's, of course, 90.7 FM in terrestrial media. But uh, without further ado, our brother, our friend and brother and comrade, Joe Horn. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, brother. Um, we want to keep this very tight. Um, just want to kind of ask you some grand tour questions. Some of your thoughts on some of the events that we're seeing now. Are there parallels in history? Um, you know, Some of this stuff, does it rhyme with things you've seen before in the broader arc of historical trends and what's going on around the world? And what are some of the courses of action that it seems to you might be best for us to pursue to continue to try to build this better society? And I thought we might open uh, here in the United States, although in my mind now, I want to ask you about Peru. But I, I know you know you make all those connections. But uh, I want to ask you about the events in Florida, uh, mm -hmm. where Andrew DeSantis and hit that legislation down there introduced this Stop Woke Act, wrong to our kids and employees. Uh, we know, of course, it's been challenged in federal court and there's an injunction. But whether it be they call it K-20 there, of course, uh, not just K-12, but also undergraduate and graduate school, this kind of policing of what is taught. And uh, this attempt, his latest uh, stunt, to attempt to uh, not allow the advanced placement course that the College Board has developed that is going to be formally debuted in February, uh, not to allow it to be taught in the state of Florida, uh, as someone who has done a lot of work with teaching and learning, who wrote his own uh, curriculum framework and model. In fact, I got that book around here somewhere on teaching and learning African African American history and U.S. history. Any thoughts on you know what's going on in Florida and how that might connect to some broader trends and challenges we should be paying attention to? Well, when I think of what Governor DeSantis in Florida has sought to do by barring advanced placement courses in African American history. It reminds me of something that I think is very difficult for some to absorb. That is to say that if you actually teach African-American history accurately, it effortlessly tends to contradict the so-called glory of US history. And this occurred to me when I was watching the Hollywood film Woman King with Viola Davis, which of course, was shut out of the Oscar nominations, that is to say Viola Davis's stirring performance was shut out. And it's about uh, this group of woman, women warriors who were fighting against the slave trade. And when you watch that movie, <clears throat> which is <clears throat> represents a multi-million dollar investment, you see that <clears throat> for these Africans, being shipped to North America was a defeat. The grand narrative of the United States history is supposedly that coming to the United States is something that everybody wants to do, and is something that is the glory of the United States of America. And so when Governor DeSantis seeks to bar Black history, what he's seeking to do is to uplift a false narrative of how this country was built to downplay, if not ignore, the fact that it was built upon the shoulders and upon the exploitation of free African labor, but it's actually more pernicious and insidious than that, because uh, Governor DeSantis also has gone after corporations like Disney, a major employer in his state, for supposedly not signing on sufficiently to the right-wing agenda. 
And this is a very uh, ominous and dangerous trend that you see across the United States. In Texas, for example, from where I'm speaking, the attorney general has gone after Wall Street firms because he says they have not been sufficiently energetic in helping to finance gun manufacturers. And so uh, <laughs> this is part of this attempt by the Republican right wing to attack on all fronts from the right, even up to and including attacking Fortune 500 corporations. And when this has happened in other countries, we've oftentimes employed the F word. That is to say that it has the odor of fascism. And I don't think we should ignore that particular analogy in talking about Florida and Texas. Thank you, Gerald. In fact, man, this is fascinating. As you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about all of the fronts, as you say, these full spectrum fronts. Uh, we saw House Bill 1467 in Florida, which is actually seeking to police what school teachers in Manatee County have on their in their on their classroom shelves in terms of books and saying that all the books must be vetted now by trained professionals, librarian, librarians and, and others. But as you were talking, I'm also thinking about uh, the 1619 project, the Hulu documentary, the six part documentary that's just debuted with our, our, our friend and colleague, Nicole Hannah Jones, and also the fact that your work, particularly the counter revolution of 1776, kind of was injected into that project, the New York Times iteration, and has pulled that project, I, I don't wanna say to the left, but it's certainly radicalized it in ways I don't even think that Nicole thought about at the onset. All of that in the context of the fact that I saw that in January of this year, the American History, uh, American Historical Review devoted a special section to the 1619 project. About 19 historians <laughs> weighed in on the 1619 project. And, and as someone who has reminded us from the onset of the 1619 project business uh, about the fact that, as you say, Africans were drawn into this uh, settler colonial uh, project in this hemisphere through the Spanish, not the English. Uh, how concerned should we be about this clearly fascist attempt to not only shrink our imaginations and, and impact education, but how concerned we should, should we be about whether or not it can be effective? I mean, do you have any ideas in terms of how we can might think about, can they actually do this? Because apparently this stuff is getting out everywhere and it's being influenced by scholars like you who have been, of course, writing and talking about this for decades. Well, what I find particularly disturbing, I, I have to confess, is the failure <clears throat> of radicals in the United States because I'm here to, to bring the unfortunate news that some of the sharpest attacks and critiques of this attempt to rewrite U.S. history have come from those who consider themselves to be radical. But they object to the idea that there was something less than glorious about the founding of the United States of America. And they would say this at the same time that they say they want to turn current and contemporary U.S. society uh, on its ear, on its head. Obviously, that makes no sense, because if this society was so great in the beginning, well, why do you want to turn it on its head and on its ear today? With regard to what is to be done, I think that the reliable ally of Black people in North America going back centuries has been the international community. And one of the things I also find disturbing is that at this particular moment, we're at a real turning point. In, in terms of what's happening worldwide. And we see this growing rift between Africa and the United States with regard to Africa resisting the legislation introduced by Congressman Gregory Meeks, the Congressional Black Caucus, which would seek to penalize and pulverize African nations who do not join the sanctions crusade against Russia. And this has led to the castigation of South Africa in particular, uh, which hosted the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, just in the last week. We see that the president of Belarus, perhaps Russia's closest ally in Europe, is landing in Zimbabwe in a few days. And it does not behoove the Black American community to go along with Washington at the same time that Africa is pulling away from Washington. Because as Africa pulls away from Washington, we see Washington is turning to the right. I, I need not remind you, I'm sure, that the latest chief of staff in the White House, Mr. Zeitz, the former COVID coordinator, replacing Ron Klain, 
is not only one of the richest men in the United States, but he's married into a family from apartheid South Africa whose wealth is based upon the exploitation of black mining labor. Yes. Uh, Hunter Biden, the notorious son of <laughs> Mr. Biden, is married similarly. And so uh, I'm very disturbed by the fact that our leadership, and in fact, many of our intellectuals, are not necessarily keeping up with what's going on in the world, and that is to our ultimate detriment. Absolutely. I want to come back uh, to that after the break, Gerald, and maybe talk some more about this uh, this broad theme you bring up in terms of Black people in the United States, people of African descent's relationship to Africans other places and how, as the African world seems to be turning away from the United States, uh, many people in this uh, society here, here in the United States, particularly quote unquote leadership, seem to be turning inward. And, and I wanna talk a little bit about that in a very, and maybe ask you a very specific question as it relates to our young people and education, particularly something that was announced at Howard University recently, a $90 million grant from the US military and the Air Force. <laughs> So when we come back uh, on the other side of this break with uh, our brilliant brother and commentator and man who has always been a global presence, but especially so these days, Gerald Horn, we want to ask him about these issues and more here at the Black Team. Back in a moment. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. We're joined with a regular guest on the network and beyond, Gerald Horn. Gerald, you you know, I was thinking about some of the news, of course, that you are always abreast of and helping us connect, make connections with uh, a lot of the former French colonies in, in West Africa seem to be turning toward Russia and away from France. Uh, certainly, we've seen news uh, recently. Uh, of course, there's Nigerian elections are coming up. And then, and then Nigeria, of course, which is slated to be the third most populous country in the world shortly uh, behind China and India. And of course, China's population may go south rather than north. Uh, recently, we saw that Howard University uh, made a big splash by getting nearly a hundred million dollars to head an HBCU consortium, a number of other HBCUs uh, to set up uh, a relationship uh, center, one of 14 existing centers uh, that will be doing work with the United States military. The United States, uh, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a black man, of course, Lord Austin, was on Howard's campus to announce this along with the president of Howard University and leadership at Howard. Also, the secretary of the Air Force, because this is the particular conduit. As we see these developments around the world, as Africans seem to be choosing themselves and their relationships with each other and other people over relationships with the United States, what does that bode for African people in the United States to see institutions like our historically black colleges and universities seem to be drawn into a, a closer kind of relationship with a United States war machine and war engine that has wreaked havoc around the world. Well, I was quite concerned when I read that news article about Howard University, because as you know, I'm publishing a book in a few months on Washington, D.C. And you can't talk about Washington, D.C. and its preeminent role in the Black liberation struggle without talking about Howard University, uh, because this is the university that not only produced uh, the man once known as Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, the man once known as Leroy Jones and Mary Baraka, T Tony Morrison, and then from the other side of the coin, uh, Vernon Jordan, the former head of the Urban League and a mover and shaker on Wall Street uh, subsequently, and so when Howard opens his arms to the Pentagon, uh, alarm bells should go off. And I expect our friends and comrades at Howard 
to similarly uh, raise their voices because once again, I don't think that this is in the best interest of black people because it's clear that there is concern that with this turn in the international community that I've just made reference to, you had a prominent French intellectual just the other day say that the world is on the verge of World War III. And he suggested, and I'm speaking of Emmanuel Todd, speaking in Le Figaro, that it's not clear if the North Atlantic countries led by the United States will prevail in their standoff against Russia and China. Well, it's interesting to note as well that with this turn away from Russia and all of its resources, particularly energy, natural gas, petroleum, gold, et cetera, Europe and the North Atlantic countries are looking towards Africa for these resources. They're looking to further deepen their claws into the flesh of Africa, Nigerian petroleum, Angolan petroleum, Algerian natural gas, South African gold, South African palladium, Namibian uranium. And Africans want to protect their resources. They don't want to be the horse to the North Atlantic rider. And the question becomes, well, where does black America stand with regard to that? Do we stand alongside our African brothers and sisters or do we stand alongside the North Atlantic countries who championed the African slave trade not so long ago in historical terms and continue to wink or acquiesce to our killings on the streets of these cities after normal police stops as happened in Memphis most recently. Yes. Yes. In fact, it's interesting. Of course, all the headlines in the month of January were about this epic struggle in the U.S. Congress to elect the Speaker of the House, something they said they hadn't been seen since the 1920s. And then before that, the 1850s. And I remember thinking to myself, we have to ask Gerald about this, because as you know better than all of us, the 1850s struggle for a speaker was about slavery. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> wondering if you have any comments on that. But but in that context, there was this celebration of the now leader of the minority party in Congress, of course, Hakeem Jeffries. And while we celebrate this notion of the ascension of this man of African descent, as you've mentioned by evoking Gregory Meeks and others, when it comes to foreign policy, the two parties seem to be much closer together than it would than they are when it comes to some of these domestic policies. And 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 I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we should be thinking, because when you talk about black America and what we should be doing, obviously class plays a role in rank and file folk who are watching Black Table, who are listening to you in Pacifica Network and everywhere else, probably Aren't, don't include most of those folks aren't the policymakers that are pushed out there as our leaders, so to speak. You know, how do we impact those elected leaders who we we celebrate more kind of for um, demographic purposes? Look at us, look at where we're going, than necessarily political purposes, particularly when it comes to U.S. foreign policy. I think we should normalize and regularize the route of engaging in primary challenges to. Mm -hmm members of the Congressional Black Caucus, because I think that that's when we can raise these issues. That's when we can try to drag these Congressional Black Caucus members to the left. And with regard to Hakeem Jeffries, as you know, he's a regular vote in favor of aid to Israel. Now, he comes from Crown Heights, Brooklyn, New York, which has been a flashpoint in terms of black Jewish tensions in recent years and decades. But I don't think that that should exculpate him with regard to sending billions uh, to the apartheid Zionist state at the same time that in his home borough of Brooklyn, a homelessness uh, continues to prevail. Uh, with regard to other events in Washington and with regard to that vote for the speaker, I put that in the context of the January 6th report. Recall that Congressman Benny Thompson of Mississippi of the Black Caucus chaired the committee that investigated the insurrection, the attempted coup on January 6, 2021. And I think that it's important to see the speaker's election as a kind of slow motion coup d'etat, just as January 6, 2021 was a blitzkrieg attempted coup d'etat, that is to say, to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. Now they're playing the long game. They're even considering wrecking uh, Social Security and Medicare in terms of the so-called uh, 
debate about the uh, debt ceiling, raising the U.S. debt ceiling so the United States can pay its bills. But it's even deeper than that, because even though I think the January 6th report was a worthy document to peruse, the elephant in the room that it did not examine is the fact that January 6th, like in the 1850s, was an attempt to extend white power. It was, we, we should not see it as accidental or coincidental that virtually all of those who were storming the Capitol on January 6th were defined as white. Uh, they came from various class backgrounds. This is nothing new for the United States. That was the same course of action, I'm afraid to say, in the 1850s. And so until we're able to recognize these basic truths, and likewise, until we're able to convince those who consider themselves to be radical that it is highly appropriate, indeed mandatory, to examine race, not only from the point of view of the oppressed Black, but also from the point of view of those who would like to extend white power indefinitely into the future. Yes. You know, it, it, as you're talking, I'm thinking about uh, another question forms my mind is, you know, are we are we nearing, do you think we're nearing another in these kind of perpetual uh, event horizons when as it relates to federalism? As you say, I mean, the tensions that we see, I mean, obviously the 1850s are pre-13, 14th and 15th amendments, and there's a kind of forestalling. I'm thinking about your work on Du Bois and of course Du Bois's work itself, particularly Black Reconstruction. And then you have the white lash and then you have the tensions rise again. But with this current cycle, uh, it seems that federalism is on the brink once again. Uh, as we saw, uh, re, uh, there's a special election that's going to take place in Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Supreme Court, a conservative justice has retired, and they're going to dump millions into this battle with the idea that perhaps extreme gerrymandering might be uh, blunted in Wisconsin if the Supreme Court can move back toward the so-called liberal wing. But all of it just seems to have a feel to me of uh and many to many people i'm asking you about this of a kind of tension as it relates to even the federal polity remaining together and it's almost like are, are, do you think we're reaching another crisis moment in what has been a series of crises since the founding of this settler state i, th I think so and you see this in particular with regard to the dobbs case mm -hmm. the supreme court case overturning roe versus wade and basically suggesting that women's reproductive freedoms should be tossed back into 50 state capitals. Uh, this basically means that if you're in a so-called red state like Texas and you're a woman, uh, you will have less rights and fewer rights than if you were in a so-called blue state like uh, California. And it's even deeper than that because from their perch in these so-called red states, the reactionaries and the conservatives can influence the national discourse leading to what we saw in New York state, which we had thought was a blue state, anti-Republican party state. But one of the many reasons why the Republicans have a four vote majority in the house is because of the Republicans ability to flip a number of congressional districts in New York state assisted by a high court in New York that was obviously influenced by the national conservative shape discourse leaning to the right. And so even though this federalism notion, this idea of the states as 50 different laboratories is apparently the idea of a majority on the US Supreme Court, it's a bit more complex and complicated than that because as noted, uh, you cannot necessarily see these boundaries and borders that separate the states as being incapable of being permeated. Uh, that is the lesson of the congressional elections in New York State, by the way. You want to walk across the bridge that you just built and use uh, perhaps Congressman George Santos <laughs> out of Brazil to walk toward Brazil, in fact, and maybe ask you about how all of this plays against the clear international picture that's emerging in terms of some of the elections in places like Brazil, uh, so what's going on in Peru, and what lessons we can learn from that in terms of what we're doing here in the United States. So we'll be back in a moment with uh, Dr. Gerald Hunter here at the Black Table. Back in a moment.
Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Please remember to support the Black Star Network. You're not going to hear this kind of conversation anywhere else. Uh, certainly donate uh, to the Black Star Network, download the app, join the Bring the Funk fan club, and watch our network. We've now been added to the Amazon TV lineup, so you'll be able to follow the Black Table there. Back at the table here with uh, Dr. Gerald Horn. Prof, as you talk about these New York districts that were flipped, one of them, uh, is now uh, represented uh, Long in Long Island, Hempstead, and some of the places there by a man. I guess his name, one of his names is George Santos. Apparently, he was invited to the White House the other night and didn't go. Uh, uh, some people speculate because you had to go through a security check and maybe didn't want to put his real name. But uh, <laughs> the Brazilians are looking for him, Gerald. So I'm wondering if you could even, that bridge you just built in terms of domestic U.S. policy, any thoughts on what's going on in places like Brazil, where clearly Lula da Silva is making the noise to kind of re-knit or knit closer together the the, the, the the southern part of the Western Hemisphere's coalition and how the United States is looking nervously with an eye toward the Mexicans and the Brazilians and everyone else and what's going on in Peru and uh you know, it seems like George Santos, if he went to Brazil, he would be in jail <laughs> as opposed to fleeing to the United States where he can kind of make the come up. Any thoughts on how we should be thinking internationally about what's going on in the hemisphere and how it relates to U.S. foreign policy? Well, first of all, with regard to Mr. Santos, he's obviously a gift that keeps on giving to late night <laughs> comics. Uh, here's a man whose name we really don't know as of this late date a man who lied, or as he said, embellished his resume with regard to uh, working at Goldman Sachs, the Wall Street firm in terms of graduating from Baruch College, where he supposedly played on the volleyball team, which he did not, uh, with regard to graduating from New York University, which he did not. He even claims that he's part black, believe it or not. I guess yeah. he, he's not aware of the one drop rule in the United <laughs> States, which is unlike Maybe you should read. Uh, maybe you should read uh, the Deepest South because uh, yeah. I suspect. <laughs> you know, who knows? I mean, you know, he's certainly gonna claim that in Brazil he wouldn't be. But 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 go ahead. Gerald. He also claims that he is a descendant of Holocaust survivors, although he amended that to say that he is not Jewish but Jewish, like blackish in the TV show or grownish, for example. Now. The sad part is that the joke is on us because he's a hardline right winger. He's going to be a reliable vote for Speaker Kevin McCarthy. You might have seen the photo of him giving the white power signal uh, to the right wing white nationalists uh, in his base. Now, I should also say that this relationship between Brazil and the United States stretches back to the bad old days of the African slave trade. Uh, you may recall that after the South was defeated in 1865 in the U.S. Civil War, you had thousands of slave owners with their so-called property in tow post-1865 who migrate to Brazil. So some of us might even have relatives in Brazil that we do not know about. Brazil did not abolish slavery until 1888. So George Santos comes out of that right-wing tradition in Brazil, and as you suggested, the Brazilian authorities are seeking to have him extradited to face the music there. And I should say the same thing about his uh, apparent leader, speaking of the defeated Brazilian president, Mr. Bolsonaro, who just tried to execute a coup on January 8th, uh, a la January 6th, where they stormed the Capitol, speaking of his supporters. He's now lollygagging in Florida, communing with his good buddy, uh, the 45th US president, uh, Mr. Trump. And we should take this event very seriously because once again, if we ignore these international trends at the same time that our opponents stateside are enmeshed in these international trends, then we're ultimately the loser. Keep in mind that Steve Bannon, the former advisor to Mr. Trump, 
is knee deep in Brazilian politics, just like he's knee deep in European politics. The right wing in the United States gets momentum from the right wing abroad and then uses the momentum to come after us while we, for some strange reason, are oftentimes inattentive to these global developments, inattentive to the uh, coup in Peru, for example, inattentive even to the US pressure on Mexico, even though during the battle days of slavery, once again, you had thousands of Africans who walked from Texas to freedom in Mexico. And yet, as the United States puts pressure on the government in Mexico City, with regard to Mexico opening up its energy resources to exploitation by Texas oil men, many of our leaders and intellectuals have nothing to say, and ultimately that's to our detriment. Gerald, you know, it, right, let's look at that. I mean, looking, of course, at President Obrador in, in Mexico and looking at some of the things that have already been said by President uh, Lula, Lula da Silva in, in Brazil in terms of strengthening ties between Brazil and Mexico or resuming the strengthening of those ties in many ways. You know, what what does that kind of bode for the United States if uh, Mexico is able to resist some of this ramped up pressure coming from the United States as a result of what has happened in Brazil and the Brazilian elections, thinking even specifically about the uh, way that the United States wants to basically invade Haiti or, or strengthen its invasion of Haiti and how Mexico, they were trying to strong arm Mexico to help them go along with that. I mean, any any thoughts on the impact of the victory of Lula da Silva in Brazil on shifting politics in the hemisphere and how that might actually uh, help strengthen a kind of uh, resistance to this pressure the United States and, and of course, the businessmen who do business in its borders are trying to exert in the hemisphere. Well, Lula just executed this past week a monumental maneuver. Uh, at a meeting of Latin American and Caribbean states, he and the leader of Argentina have decided to create a common currency. That is to say, a currency that will lead to the downplaying of the U.S. dollar, believe it or not, all over the world. When you have a nation like Ghana in West Africa seeking to buy petroleum for Saudi Arabia, oftentimes they have to pay for it in U.S. dollars. That's no problem for the United States because the United States can just go to the printing press. But Ghana has to accumulate dollars the old fashioned way by earning them. But what you see now globally, not only in Brazil and Argentina, but worldwide, is a process known as de-dollarization. With de-dollarization, with Ghana seeking to move away from the dollar and seeking to use its gold resources with the leader of China going to Saudi Arabia and they deciding ultimately to trade Saudi's oil for Chinese currency. This is going to have significant impact on the US economy. And perhaps that bespeaks the reason why so many black leaders and intellectuals steer clear of global politics because perhaps they sense that if they take a forward leaning position on some of these issues we're discussing, not only will it bring, <clears throat> not only will it bring sharp retribution from the US authorities, but ultimately they may be seen as uh, siding with those abroad against the interests in the United States. And all you have to do is look at the uh, latter months and years of the life of Malcolm X or the career of Paul Robeson or the career of the late Martin Luther King or W.E.B. Du Bois to know that if you're perceived as going against the foreign policy interests of the United States, uh, you should be expected to be reprimanded and rebuked, if not worse. And what we need to do is bring this issue front and center to the table, because the alternative is that we'll just go down slow, uh, which is no way to go down, to be sure. You know, interesting, Gerald. I mean, obviously, most of the people you mentioned there were not elected officials, uh, although, you know, think about whether Adam Clayton Powell trying to in, be injected or inject himself into what happened in Bandung and traveling, you know, kind of with the red, white and blue, trying to keep a foot in, in both worlds, nominally speaking. And then, of course, with the Congressional Black Caucus, at least in its nearer to earlier iterations, uh, folk like Ron Dellums, Mickey Leland and others trying to be strong African foreign policy. 
um, the invasion of Iraq and, and Barbara Lee standing alone then, but now, of course, much less forceful. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what are the possibilities of black elected officials, certainly in the federal legislature, to, to take a more progressive internationalist stand? I mean, are, are they trapped now, or at least do they see themselves as trapped? And if they do, uh, you've talked about the uh, possibility, and in fact, uh, the, the, in an endorsement of primarying some of these folk, particularly in the Congressional Black Caucus. And ultimately, though, as we see the United States push to brinksmanship with the open white nationalists and fascists threatening to uh, default on U.S. debt obligations with the debt ceiling, if you are a black or a progressive legislator in the federal legislature, what choices are open to you short of trying to replace those legislatures with folk, legislators with folks who are more internationalist and, 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 and or progressive? Well, I think that there's the bully pulpit of being in the House, for example. That is to say, that gives you a platform from which you can go on to cable news shows. You can go onto the black table uh, to uh, produce and reproduce your message. And speaking of Congresswoman Barbara Lee of Berkeley, Oakland, the successor to Congressman uh, Ronald V. Dellums, one of the few open and avowed socialists in the Congress over the past half century or more, uh, her performance of late has been particularly disappointing because we had thought that she was a reliable dove. We had thought that she was a stern critic of U.S. militarism, but I was disappointed uh, to see in December 2022 when she was standing in line to embrace Mr. Zelensky as he was entering the Capitol to address the members of the U.S. Congress. And uh, this is taking place at the same time that the 76-year-old Congresswoman is planning to leave the Congress, supposedly to make a race for the U.S. Senate. But I'm scratching my head in bafflement because <laughs> she's going to be running against uh, Katie Porter of Orange County, a Congresswoman, Adam Schiff of Burbank, a Congressman, and perhaps others. And I don't think her chances are very good. And now, of course, there's this uh, trope that's being floated nowadays about a quiet quitting where you have workers uh, resigning without telling their bosses. Well, I think Barbara Lee is engaged in loud quitting. <laughs> that she's going to leave Congress with a bang with this quixotic race for the U.S. Senate. And I don't think that this is the way she would like to end her political career, which is otherwise... Uh, been a top flight performance. Absolutely. Gerald, this is such a rich conversation, man. I, I hate that we are going to have to bring it to the end, but we're going to take a break. And when we come back, uh, we will ask you a few more questions and uh, take advantage of the time we have here with you at the table. Uh, there's a lot to think about you put on the table. And I'm going to kind of come back to some of those themes and, and, and hear from you on some direction that we might take as we think through what we need to do in this world. So we'll back and be back in a moment here with our friend and brother and comrade Gerald Horn here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. When you talk about blackness, and what happens in black culture. We are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. As we've seen this hour with Professor Horn, 
The Black Star Network is working hard to provide this type of depth of analysis, and we go across the range. Anything you want to discuss and think through in the Black world and beyond, you're going to find on this network, including this show. So download the Black Star Network app, uh, join the Bring the Funk fan club, support us financially, uh, and tell your friends as we are indeed global. So, Professor Horn, as we kind of wrap up our session today, you put a lot on the table, brother, and, and think about the full political range of debate and discussion in black communities, not only internationally, but here in the United States. And there are those who say participating in the political process through elections is a, a failed strategy and kind of doesn't have a lot of value. And, and, and on the other end of the spectrum, there are those who say we must invest everything we have in the voting mechanism and process. You've managed to maintain a clear-eyed embrace of a number of perspectives. You kind of, I don't want to make the analogy of a net metronome, but you say the same things, but you're very open to engaging with folks. How, how important is solidarity politics in the way that we approach trying to problem solve in places where some folk who have different ideological positions simply won't talk to each other? Hmm. <laughs> well, I'm afraid to say that uh, that's their loss, quite frankly. Uh, I, don't, I don't think given the dire state of black affairs in the United States that we can afford the luxury of turning our backs on each other. I mean, I spend a lot of time in Los Angeles uh, right now working on different projects and you would not believe the homelessness that exists in Los Angeles. And wh what's interesting about it is that even though the population is only about 8% black, the homeless population might be 80% black. And so given that crisis, given that emergency, I don't think that we can afford to not engage with one another. Now, certainly we have to have a range of tactics and strategies. Uh, it would not be wise to put our, all our eggs in the electoral basket. At the same time, we cannot ignore the electoral ba basket because that's where our tax dollars are divvied up and we need to be at the table. Uh, once again, I would like to reiterate the point I made a moment or two ago, which is that what I would like to see going forward is not only challenging members of the political establishment, such as the Black Caucus, from the left and primaries, we need to revive that idea also, perhaps in certain districts, of forming third parties to challenge them even in the general election while avoiding the risk of having that, that lead to the election of Republican. Although in most black congressional districts, fortunately, the Republican party is a non-starter, it's a non-entity. And so we don't need, need to run that risk. So I think that even with regard to the electoral basket, we need to rethink what we've been doing of late. That's actually interesting. I, and I wanted to ask you about this. We've had several sessions here at the table with our legal roundtable, Valethea Watkins and Angela Porter, talking about these recent Supreme Court cases. And I know you've talked in a lot of spaces, including the Black Star Network, about Moore versus Harper and this independent state legislature theory. Um, what you've just said about possible third party formations, running primary challenges, and balancing that against uh, the possibility of having uh, uh, an extreme right winger or a Republican elected as a consequence of a third party challenge. You know, again, thinking about this Wisconsin Supreme Court race that's coming up where all this money is going to be dumped in and the possibility that voter suppression and gerry through gerrymander uh, might actually be on the ballot as it relates to the judiciary. And thinking about this federal case, of course, the, the, the Moore versus Harper case, the North Carolina case in this independent state legislature. Any thoughts on the judiciary? in this country, the state judiciary, the federal judiciary, um, and where we are there and, and how much attention should we be paying to who sits in the black robes and, and whether or not, you know, they actually do exercise the kind of power we kind of think they do, or, or are we reaching a crisis there where if, if some of these folks don't like the way the laws go, they simply ignore them. There doesn't seem to be a penalty for that these days. <laughs> well, certainly we cannot ignore the judiciary. Uh, like yourself, uh, I too was trained as a lawyer and I try to keep up with judicial opinions. At the same time, we need to realize that the top judicial authority, speaking of the U.S. Supreme Court, is in the 
firm grip of the right wing led by Clarence Thomas. And apparently that will be the case for some years to come. That brings me to the issue of engaging in an array of political tactics and strategies. And it reminds me of what we sought to do during the anti-apartheid era. That is to say, we not only push for the comprehensive anti-apartheid act, which we were able to push through Congress over Mr. Reagan's veto, President Reagan's veto, but we were able to do that because we were in the streets. Uh, we were uh, engaged in marches, we were engaged in sit-ins, we were engaged in petition drives, but it was also an effort where we got a lot of momentum from international activities along the same line, from Europe, from Cuba, from Africa itself, uh, from Asia. And in some ways, what we did during the anti-apartheid era presents a paradigm for how we need to proceed in the 21st century. That is to say, not ruling out any particular tactic nor strategy, but motoring ahead on all fronts. And I think for a community like ours, which is enmeshed in a state and crisis of emergency, that's the only way to go. This is a this is a excellent. And by the way, for everyone listening, yes, Gerald and I both went to law school, but Gerald was a practicing fighting lawyer, including with the National Congress of Black Lawyers, every type of coalition. So, yeah, a lot of people with JDs who did not do and do not do what you have done, brother. So, I mean, every opportunity I get a chance to ask you a question as it relates to the law. It's also a teaching moment for those of you, particularly those of you considering going to law school. If you're a young person, law students or practicing lawyers, you would do well. You would do well to to examine the legal career uh, of Gerald Horn. Gerald, I want to kind of as we kind of wind to a close today. Again, return to this AP course business. In, in, and I also want to ask you whether you think Andrew DeSantis even has a shot at winning the presidency in 24. I mean, I, I guess it should be an obvious answer, but I don't know. I want, that's why I want to ask you. But, you know, the vast majority of our students, the vast majority of students in this country are not going to take AP courses. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm kind of concerned that if they take AP African-American studies and get a high enough score on the test, that they will not take that course from you at University of Houston or me at, at Howard. And I'm kind of concerned about that as well in terms of class politics and what that says it might not say. Over the arc of the last several years since COVID hit, you've gone from someone who was very well known among many of us who read and study and, and those who are organizers and builders. You've gone from that to a presence that is, that is ubiquitous. You know, how important is it for us to think beyond some of the kind of more class attuned spaces like AP courses, elite universities, the publishing industry and academia to talk about this kind of public work. I mean, I guess in the academy, they call it public facing work. But it seems to me that you've always been grounded there. And what this technology has allowed you to do over the last several years since COVID hit is be a, a kind of global professor of sorts, global comrade, global organizer. How important is that kind of work? Oh, it's exceedingly <laughs> important. Uh, because, um, for example, on, on Monday, I, I'm doing a podcast with a brother in Uganda, for example, uh, which broadcasts heavily in Uganda, but throughout that part of Africa. So obviously, we need to take advantage uh, of, of the technology, those of us who are able to do so. Uh, with regard to the AP course, uh, I share your concern. But on the other side of the equation, what I fear is that the attack on AP, advanced play. American studies will trickle down and will hamper the ability to teach African-American history generally. I mean, that's the import of the attack on the 1619 Project. Uh, that's the import of some of the attack on my work uh, that has been getting uh, increasingly sharp and derogatory <laughs> in, in recent uh, days and weeks. With regard to Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, I think that it's going to be difficult for him to prevail over Mr. Trump, although not impossible. And I say that because a lot of what he will be able to do, too, ironically and paradoxically, depends on if uh, Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina throws her hat into the race or former CIA and Secretary of State Michael Pompeo throws his hat into the race, uh, Vice President Michael Pence. In other words, what happened, you might recall in 2016, was the plethora of Republican candidates basically uh, sliced up the anti-Trump base and Trump re 
retained a modicum of support that allowed him to get the nomination. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's what might happen in 2024. And the fact that we cannot rule out unilaterally the possibility that Mr. Trump may return to the White House, that only accentuates the point that I've been making for these past few minutes, which is that we're facing a real crisis, a real state of emergency. Absolutely. Well, we've only got about a minute left, and uh, thank you for laying that out, um, particularly the way you did. We'll have to have you back to talk about this as we get closer to the primary season. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about you've got the book on D.C. coming out, and you're always working on more than one thing. Mm -hmm. Tell us what else you're working on, brother. We always like to hear that. <laughs> well, as I intimated a moment or two ago, I've been spending a lot of time in Los Angeles. My next book, <laughs> I'm afraid to say, <laughs> is entitled Armed Struggle, question mark. Panthers, communists, and black nationalism in Southern California through the 1960s. As you know, the late Black Panther Party, they picked up the gun and it did not end very well. And so I want to re-examine what happened because I dare say that in the 21st century, if conditions tend to deteriorate, which is probably the case, you have a number of other young brothers and sisters who might want to emulate the Black Panthers. And so I want to point out the pitfalls and also what they could have done differently so that they could have survived until 2023. Well, as with all of your books, and of course, as you as you describe this project, I think about, of course, your book, The Fire Next Time, where I don't know if this is a, a can you, but it seems like all of your work, even though they may appear on the surface to be on different subjects, they all seem to connect around this question of building a better society and learning the lessons we can learn from, from our history. Well, uh, Prof, we're going to let you go. We know that you've got uh, some more work to do. As soon as we get off here, you may log on somewhere else or hit back in the archive. It's good to see you back in physical rotation, brother. I know you made a vow. I'm not going anywhere until it's safe. So it's gonna, you're feeling all right about traveling now, huh? Yeah, uh, I read the headlines and I get nervous. I mean, there's almost 600 COVID deaths per day uh, as of now. How about and so that? So that's rather startling. But I feel I have no choice. No question. In fact, uh, we're going to wrap. I know we got a minute, but I, let, me, let me see if I can squeeze this one in. Uh, the university, as we know it, we went back in person this semester at Howard, and it's a very different campus, brother. I don't know if you see any of that out there in terms of there are not as many students around. A lot of our colleagues are, are remaining virtual. Uh, it seems the university is at, a, at, a, at an inflection point as well. I don't know if you have any thoughts, final thoughts about that, the nature of actually university life in this country. Well, what, what's foremost in my mind right now, which I have to share, is that at my old campus, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the leaders of that university have decided to do an end run around the faculty by establishing an entirely new school, the School of Civic Leadership, which will be stacked and stocked with right wingers. And I'll, I'm curious to know if they're going to have to have the same publishing requirements as the rest of us, or are they going to have different requirements for this uh, conservative school? And what frightens me is that A, uh, this may portend a similar trend at other schools, and B, speaking of the US Supreme Court, uh, they're slated to gut affirmative action via a case coming, you guessed it, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and also Harvard. And that, I'm afraid to say, will be a significant and wounding blow to our young black population going forward in the 21st century. And on that exclamation point, we absolutely have to have you come back to talk about that, brother. Was not aware that I completely missed that headline. Uh, maybe Nicole did the right thing by not accepting to go down here at UNC. So thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Professor Horn. Thank you, brother, for joining us here at the Black Table again. And uh, stay safe. And everybody, we protect Gerald Horn at all costs. It's good to see you, brother. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. We'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table to clear the table and prepare for our next session. Back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shots. 
We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, joined with uh, a brother who is a regular uh, presence here on the Black Star Network and a lot of other places as well, Dr. Gerald Horn, the Morris Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Uh, this has been a very rich and productive hour, as you can tell. I would encourage you to go back into the archives here at the table for our from our for our previous conversations with Professor Horn uh, and look at the consistent themes that emerge. We must organize. We must not throw anyone out when we can engage in solidarity politics. We're facing real enemies, enemies of our common humanity, and they are organizing even as we debate small things when we should be thinking about the broader trends. We can always learn from history and we should always dedicate ourselves to building a better society by taking action, not just talking about it, but thinking about it, but actually doing something in the world. Thanks for joining us here at The Black Table. We'll see you next week. And remember, support the Black Star Network. This is Black-owned independent media, and it's not only Black-owned and independent, it is committed to building a better society. See you next week.